Happy Mother's Day. Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today I want to wish each and every mother out there a very special and happy Mother's Day. Today's the day that we set aside to honor our mothers, to honor the mothers of our children, as well as those who were mothers to us. Even though they may not have given birth to us, to us, nonetheless, they were mothers. For they are indeed mothers. I'm talking about our grandparents. I'm talking about our church mothers. I'm talking about friends of the family mothers. Where would we be without our mothers? Our message today is entitled, A Mother's Burden. There are two types of mothers. There is Mirab, the mother without a burden. She doesn't seem to be flustered about the lostness of her family. She doesn't have the time nor the desire to pray for her family. Mirab does not have a mother's burden. If her family is lost, then they're lost. Mirab is not that concerned. Then there's Rispa, the mother with a burden. No one else carries a burden of a mother like Rispa. And so today, we want to take a quick peek inside the life of a mother and see the burden she was handed and forced to bear all by herself. Forced to bear this heavy burden on her own. Turn with me, please, to our scripture found in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 7 through 14. The king took the two sons of Rispah, the daughter of Ayah, whom she bore to Saul, Armani and Mephishbosheth, and the five sons of Merab, the daughter of Saul, whom she bore to Adrael, the son of Barzeli, the Mahalathite. And he gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them on the mountain before the Lord. And the seven of them perished together. They were put to death in the first days of harvest, at the beginning of barley season. Then Rispa, the daughter of Ea, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock. From the beginning of harvest until rain fell upon them from the heavens. And she did not allow the birds of the air to come upon them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. When David was told that Rispa, the daughter of Ea, the concubine of Saul, had done, David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan from the men of Jabesh Gilead, who had stolen them from the public square of Beth Shan, where the Philistines had hanged at them on the day the Philistines killed Saul on Gilboa. And he brought up from there the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan, and they gathered the bones of those who were hanged. And they buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the land of Benjamin and Zila, in the tomb of Kish, his father. And they did all the, that the king commanded. And after that, God responded to the plea for the land. This is not the first time that Rispa is caught in the middle of a dispute. A few chapters earlier, chapter 3 to be exact, finds Rispa center stage of a dispute between King Ishbosheth the son of King Saul, and Abner, the general of King Saul's army. But before we get into their dispute, I want to tell you who Rispa is. We know that Mirab is the mother without a burden. She neither intercedes for, nor does she pray God's safety and protection on her family or her children. Mirab is selfish and self-absorbed. 
She only thinks about her own comfort and what makes her happy. She's not going out on a limb or she's not being discomforted for anyone, including her own offspring. Rispa, on the other hand, is just the opposite. First and foremost, Rispa is a mother. She has at least two boys for the late King Saul. The name Rispa means either pavement or cooking stone. It comes from the verb rasap, rasap. And that means to piece together. So one could decipher that the name Rispa is one like a pavement, permanent, and is solid and dependable as a cooking stone and who pieces together what has been broken. And how many can identify with a mother like Rispa? Next, Rispa is the concubine of King Saul. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Rispa, the daughter of Ea. And Ishbosheth said to Abner, Why have you gone into my father's concubine? And then Abner was very angry over the words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog's head of Judah? To this day I keep showing steadfast love to the house of Saul, your father to his brothers and to his friends and have not given you into the hand of David and yet you charge me today with a fault concerning a woman? So Ishbosheth accuses Abner, the general of the army, of sleeping with his father's concubine, a charge that Abner neither confirms nor denies. He just gets blue mad as they say and swears to assist David to take full control of the whole kingdom. He's gonna have it all, and Abner's gonna help him do it. Now Rispa must still be living in the palace in order for Ishbosheth to know that Abner had gone into her and slept with her. So why did Abner get so annoyed when Ishbosheth accuses him of sleeping with his father's concubine? I suppose that it would be the same reason why Adonijah asked Abishai's hand in marriage and why it cost him his life. It can be understood that when someone of influence, like the elder brother of King Saul, like the general of the army, when someone of influence takes over the harem of a king, it gives that person clean to the throne. Adonijah understood that, as did Solomon. So much so that Solomon saw it as a bid for his throne by Adonijah, his older brother. And so Solomon sentenced Adonijah to death because of it. It was seen as treason. Ishbosheth probably saw it as a bid by Abner, who was growing more and more powerful in the house of Saul. But Abner was an honorable man, and even if he had gone into Rispa and had sexual relationship with her, it was not because he was jockeying for the throne. If he had wanted the throne, he would have made a play for it at the death of King Saul. And he would have seized the throne because there was no one strong enough to oppose him. But instead, he installed Saul's son, Ishbosheth, on the throne, thus preserving King Saul's dynasty, showing love and kindness and loyalty to the house of King Saul. And that is why he was so upset, because Ishbosheth was accusing him or questioning his loyalty to the family. And so he said, in essence, since you think that I'm disloyal after I have all I have done for you and for your family, I will show you what disloyalty looks like. I will make it my personal goal to see that David rules the whole kingdom as God has promised him. 
All of that was centered around Rispa. Whether she knew it or not, she was caught right smack dab in the middle of a large and heated dispute. Now, here she is again, several years later, in the middle of another dispute. And once again, it is all because of who she is and her relationship with the late King Saul. Evidently, King Saul, in his zeal for the Lord, began to persecute the Gibeonites, whom Joshua had made a peace covenant with, as per Joshua chapter 9. And because the king of Israel had broken the peace agreement, the peace covenant that Joshua had made on behalf of Israel all of those hundreds of years ago and had sworn it before the Lord God, God brought judgment of the nation of Israel. The judgment was famine for three years. When King David sought the Lord as to the cause as the, the reason for this famine, year after year, famine, famine, famine. He found out, or he was told that it was because of his predecessor, King Saul, and him persecuting, his, his um, persecution of the Gibeonites. King David inquired of the Gibeonites, what can I do to make this right? so that the Lord will again hear our prayers and heal our land and send rain that we might grow crops and feed our families. They said, give us seven of Saul's descendants that we might put them to death and the debt will be forgiven. We'll forget all about what Saul tried to do to us. So David complies with the request. And this is where we meet Rispa again. She is now a mother in peril, a mother with a heavy, heavy burden. It's her burden. What is her burden? Rispa's two sons, along with five sons of Mirab, the daughter of Saul, are chosen to be given to the Gibeonites to be put to death in order to make level what the, the wrongs that were done to them. When Rispa found out the destiny of her two sons, she was determined not to let her, her, the, her son's bodies be defiled by birds and by wild beasts. Let us look at what she did. 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 7 through 9. The king took the two sons of Rispa, the daughter of Ea, whom she bore to Saul, Armani, and Mephibosheth, the five sons of Merab, the daughter of Saul, whom she bore to Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Mahalathite, and he gave them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them on the mountain before the Lord, and the seven of them perished together. They were put to death in the first days of harvest, at the beginning of the barley harvest. Rispa's two boys, probably her only two sons, were put to death in the first days of the barley harvest. The barley harvest was in the spring when everything is beginning to come to life again. The time of the celebration of the Passover. So in one of the most joyous times of the year, Rispa is handed down a heavy burden, one that no mother should ever have to bear, and even worse, to bear it alone. So while everyone else is preparing for harvest, a time of festivities, preparing for Passover, preparing to celebrate, Rispa is preparing for mourning. The Gibeonites hanged the seven of them on the mountain before the Lord. And the seven of them died there on the mountain. Understand that my burden is not your burden. My joy is not your joy. And so it was with Rispa. She only had the two boys. She only had the two sons. While Mirab had 
five sons hanged. But it was Rispa alone who got sackcloth and spread it for herself on a stone on the mountainside. See, in the ancient, ancient Near East, the use of a garment made of sackcloth came to symbolize sorrow or submission, according to the Lexham Bible Dictionary. Rispa, meaning pavement, meaning cooking stone, showed her sorrow and her submission to the king and the king's judgment by spreading for herself sackcloth on a rock to show her solidarity to her decision, the decision that she had made. She was a mother with a great, great burden. I want you to further understand that Jesus is our rock. Like Rispa, when we are in trouble or in deep mourning for our children, this mother, like this mother, she was in deep mourning. So like her, we are to submit ourselves to our rock, Jesus Christ, and do not blame the King, King Jesus, but only submit to his will and to his way. Mirab, the princess, the eldest daughter of King Saul, who, by the way, was the first what was first promised to King David as a wife, but Saul did not keep his word. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 19. But at the time when Mirab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, she was given to Adriel, the Mahalathite, for a wife. So could David have volunteered her five sons as a sacrifice out of vindictiveness? I do not know. But what I do know is there is no record of Mirab joining Rispa on a sackcloth thrown over that rock. There is no record of Mirab joining Rispa in mourning for her sons. There's no record of Mirab joining in to intercede for her sons. There's no record of her protecting the bodies of her sons that they would not be father defiled. There's just no record that says, hey, Rispa, would you like to take turns keeping watch over the bodies of our sons? But instead, there's only Rispa, the mother with a burden, the mother who spread for herself sackcloth on the rock to keep vigilant or, or to keep vigilance over the bodies of her two boys. Then by default, Mirab's five boys, their bodies were also protected because of Rispa. When a mother with a burden begins to keep watch, when she begins to pray, when she begins to spread her sackcloth on the rock, on the mountainside, other mother's sons begin to get free. The same ones your son is gangbanging with right now, the same ones your daughter is using drugs with, are the very same ones who will also be set free, along with your child, if you would just intercede on behalf of your children. For the effectual, fervent prayers of a burdened mother availeth much. Just like those prisoners who listened as Paul and Silas began to sing, as Paul and Silas began to worship, as Paul and Silas began reciting psalms in that Philippian jail that night, as they got free, in the same way, those who are imprisoned with your child, whatever they're into, whatever has them bound up, will also be set free if you have a burden, mother. So Rispa spread sackcloth on a rock for herself, indicating that she's there for the long haul. She is absolute in her conviction. She is solid as the rock she sits on. And she stays there on that mountainside from the beginning of barley harvest until the rains fall on her. The barley harvest, as I said, is in the spring. They were to bring the tithe of the harvest the first day of the week after the Passover. So Rispa stays from the middle of April all the way through until the rains came in September or October, some five or six months later. 
day and night, she is there. She wakes up in the middle of the night, rolls out of bed, and pleads to the Lord God Almighty for her children. She calls them by name before the throne of God. Oh Lord, Lord my God, save my child. Lord, bring my daughter home. My son is experimenting. Save him, Lord. Save him. My child is strung out on drugs. My son is a meth user. My daughter is strung out on crack. Lord, please have mercy on my child. Have mercy, O oh Lord. Night and day, Rispa is on the rock. She's on her knees. Night and day, Rispa is worshiping. Night and day, Rispa is seeking God on behalf of her children. Night and day, for five or six months, come rain, come snow, come heat, come cold. Rispa is there. No time is too long for Rispa. Rispa is a mother with a burden. Who would have that kind of tenacity? Only the burden of a mother could cause someone to sit on sackcloth spread out on the rock for five or six months, fighting off wild beasts, fighting off the birds of the air. Her sons were defiled, being left out and exposed to the elements. But Rispa, a mother with a burden, refused to let her two dead sons be defiled any further by wild animals or by the birds of prey. She had to depend on someone to bring her food to eat. She had to depend on someone to bring her water to drink. But she is not leaving her position. She is not leaving where she sits. She is not leaving the rock on which she stands, on which she sits, on which she lies down, on which she kneels. She has commissioned herself to be on that rock, to intercede for her family, to intercede for her children. Rispa is a mother with a burden. But when David, the king, was told, when the king heard what Rispa had done, he was so moved with compassion that, well, let us read what he did. 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 11 through 14. When David was told what Rispa, the daughter of Ea, the concubine of Saul, had done, David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan from the men of Jabesh Gilead, who had stolen them from the public square of Bethshan, where the Philistines had hanged them on the day the Philistines killed Saul on Gilboa. And he brought them from there, the bones of Saul and the bones of his son Jonathan, and they gathered the bones of those who were hanged. And they buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the land of Benjamin in Zila, in the tomb of Kish, his father. And they did all that the king commanded. After that, God responded to the plea of the land. When King David heard about it, not only did he send and get the grandfather or the father of, uh, uh, of those two boys, no, no, uh, not only did, did, did he go and get the grandfather of those five boys that belonged to Mirab, but he, he went and got Jonathan's bones as well, the uncle, the brother-in-law. He got those bones, and then he went and gathered all the other bones, those two boys for Rispa, those five boys for Mirab. He got all of those bones and he brought them back and he gave them a burial, a proper burial. He honored those dead men. He buried them and that was all Rispa wanted. Some dignity for her children. And Merod's boys, they received dignity, dignity as well because of Rispa. The prayers of a mother a burdened mother availeth much. Now here is what I want you to understand. Mountains represent places of worship. Sackcloth 
represents humbling yourself. And the rock represents Jesus. Therefore, when a mother decides to humble herself and begin to pray and begin to worship and begin to intercede for her children without discrimination, it gets the attention of the king. It gets the attention of King Jesus. Mom, your daughter might be strung out on drugs right now. You may have to get up in the middle of the night, go looking through crack houses to find her and to bring her home. May you be going through the un undesirable places, the most undesirable places, filthy places to find your beloved daughter that drugs have stolen from you. But I want to tell you, there's hope. Your son may be a gangbanger now. He might even be serving time in prison on a gang-related charges. There may be, see, like there's no hope, but let me tell you, there's hope. There's always hope. When you begin to intercede for your family, you get the attention of the king. When you get the attention of the king, things happen. Maybe the school system has taught your children that there is no God and they believed it. Or maybe college has convinced them that God is dead. Maybe your child is confused by the erroneous teachings on the internet or he or she has married into the wrong religion and that religion has influenced your child, your son, your daughter, that Jesus did not die for their sins. Well, I'm here today to tell you mothers, don't give up on your children. Do as Rispa did. Spread your sackcloth on the rock right there on the mountainside and intercede for your child. Intercede for your children. Chase away the birds of the air by day. Chase away the beasts of the field by night. Intercede for your child. Call them by name before the throne of grace. What am I talking about? I'm talking about humbling yourself and getting into a mode of worship. Begin to pray, begin to intercede, begin to worship the Lord for however long it takes. Stay on the rock. Keep vigil over your children. When the king hears what you have done, when it comes up before him, when it comes before him in golden vows, he will hear, he will see. When Jesus sees what you, you are doing, he will be moved, or he will move heaven. He will move earth to come to your children's rescue. He is a delivering God. There's no God like our God. There's no rock like our rock. His goodness is forever. His mercy is forever. His love is forever. He will not always chide, but he will come quickly to our rescue. Spread out your sackcloth of humbleness. Stay on the rock of steadfastness. Be persistent in prayer. No matter what comes, no matter how long it takes. As Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 12, rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Continue this in all faithfulness and see what God will do for you. There is hope for your children. You are not alone. I'm calling to all you mothers with a burden for your children. Now, I'm asking you, call upon the name of your God, the God of heaven's armies. Call upon him for your children. Rispa was now a single mother. Saul was killed in the battle on the Mount of Gilboa. The dynasty had changed hands. It went to, Saul, uh, went to David. What does this mean? Well, you might be a single mom raising rebellious children. The life you, you're now living is not the life you were promised. It is not the life you had envisioned. It is not the life you signed up for. But remember, you have a heavenly father, one that sees all, hears all, and he is always, always, always on your side. I'm speaking to you today. Maybe your children are not that far away. Maybe they're not experimenting. Maybe they're, 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 they're not 
strung out on drugs. Maybe they come to church with you sometimes. They come to church on special occasions for sure. Maybe they come to church with you every Sunday, but they're not living the Christian life. They're not serving our Lord Jesus. They're good kids, yes, they're good kids, but they're not born again kids. And you are a mother with a burden for your child. If that's you, I want to pray with you. I want to believe that God will hear. And if he hears, I am believing that he will answer. I want to pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, I come before you today and I lift up all of these mothers, the mothers with a burden. And I'm asking you, O oh Lord God, to hear their prayers when they roll out of bed at night and fall on their knees and, and to seed for their children. When they're talking to their children, when they're explaining to their children, oh Lord God, open their hearts to hear. Open their hearts to believe. Let their eyes be open to what's going on, oh Lord God. I pray for every child, for every parent that's listening right now who's away from you. Oh Lord God, soften their hearts. Let the burden of conviction fall upon them. Oh Lord God, let their hearts be stirred within them right now, oh Lord God. Let them drop whatever they're doing. Those wayward sons, those wayward daughters, let them come home, oh Lord God. Mothers, I've been praying, Lord. Hear, hear the prayers of these desperate mothers and answer when you hear, oh Lord God. Deliver their children out of the hands of the enemy. Call them forth, oh Lord God. Call him forth like you call Lazarus. Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Oh, Lord God, we call every child. Come forth. Come out of wherever you are. We break the chains of sin. We break those chains of addiction. We rebuke those demonic spirits that, that, that hold them. Those lion spirits. The spirits of addiction. We command you in the name of Jesus to let go of that child. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We command you to let go in the name of Jesus. Oh Lord God, we thank you that you're a God who loves. A God who cares. And Lord, that we can cast our, our cares upon you because you care for us. Lord God, comfort the hearts of these mothers and bring their children home. For we believe that you have he heard. And if you have heard, you will act. So thank you, Jesus. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Now I want to ask, is there anybody out there who do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, who do not know how to pray because you do not know the saving grace of Jesus, but you would like to. I want to pray with you now. Say this prayer. Believe it with your heart. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to be an interceder. Help me to be a rispa, mother. Oh, Lord God, that I might not be like Merab, who had five sons and did not even show up one day. Oh, Lord God, I have a heavy burden. Help me to pray. Teach me to pray. Teach me to intercede. And I'll pray for my family. Thank you for saving me. I accept the free gift of life now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is get a Bible and highlight those verses. Read your Bible every single day. Every day, read your Bible. Get on a, on a reading plan. Highlight, learn those scriptures. And when you pray, call Call those verses, those verses that you've learned, call them, call them. Remind the Lord that they are your children. 
Then I want you to find a Bible-believing church, one who will pray with you, a church who will teach you, who will disciple you. Join that church. Not, not a church that, 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 that is a wayward church, but a Bible-believing church who believes in the power and the deliverance of Almighty God. Believe that the blood of Jesus still delivers, still chases demonic spirits. And still delivers your children. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. When the Lord comes back, he'll find you doing what it is that you should be doing. He said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. There you'll be with him forever and ever and ever. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us that free gift. I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers. Happy, blessed Mother's Day. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.